Hi guys, hello everyone. Thank you guys for coming and joining us for this panel on the new era of AI and deep tech. I think probably let's start with a few introductions. Um, my name's Joe Milne, I'm a science and technology uh, writer. Um, I write for outlets such as Forbes, BBC, Guardian, Quartz, um, and my main uh, remit and interest is this wonderful world of deep tech um, startups, which we're gonna get into a little bit um, with this panel. Um, Ben, why don't we start with a little bit of intro to yourself and, and Atomico before we, we kick off. Cool, okay. Hi everybody, um, I'm Ben. I'm uh, an investor at Atomico. I started life as a computer scientist, then a little bit of time as a strategy consultant, and then really kind of found my home in venture where I was able to kind of take what I loved about software engineering, innovation technology, and, and work with some of the kind of most exciting early stage technology companies really pushing the boundaries and, and kind of building real innovation there. Atomico, where Irina and I work, is a venture capital fund based in, in London. And really what we're set up to do is to support the most ambitious European entrepreneurs building game-changing companies. And when we invest, we want to partner with those companies to help them achieve their kind of global ambition and their global vision. Um, what that really means is we, we invest at sort of Series A stage primarily and between our team of investors, entrepreneurs, experienced operators, and other technologists, we really provide the, the partnership, the support, and the, the kind of infrastructure to help those companies to realize their ambitions. And I rear from your perspective, a little intro to you, but also I think the big question that um, people tend to ask, or at least I get asked a lot whenever I post an article, I tend to get uh, the, the LinkedIn troll, shall we say, always being like, why are you using this deep tech term? What is this? So maybe you could give us a little bit of a, of a definition of what you think deep tech actually is and how it differs from the, from the other areas of other kinds of non-deep tech. Sure. Um, so let me start with a quick, quick intro. Um, I work with Ben at Atomico as well. We both focus on, among others, on, on deep tech and we call it frontier tech. Um, my background is um, slightly different. I started life as a doctor back in the day. Then actually I worked with, Bain, with Ben at Bain. Uh, consulting company and then spent some time in later stage investing before joining uh, Atomico. Uh, we also get asked a lot of times what deep tech is. Um, we define it as companies that um, have a scientific or engineering innovation at their core that basically have more of a fundamental R&D component to their business. Um, and this comes with several implications in terms of how they're different to what kind of like a digital, purely digital model would be. Uh, one is uh, in founders, they tend to be more kind of academic founders um, that have PhDs or either in science or engineering. Um, another one is in teams. Um, the teams tend to be interdisciplinary from day one. You have multiple science disciplines or multiple engineering disciplines together with commercial or people from the industry. Um, there's also a slight different approach to, um, well, to long-term capital requirements. So these are businesses that require more capital at the beginning to get the product off the ground and have different value creation milestones. So the way those milestones align to funding windows um, is slightly different and the way we have to think about it is, is slightly different. Um, these would be kind of the main, and often, often actually one important thing is there's also investors tend to be a little bit different or somewhat specialized. Not all tech investors would be comfortable in a deep tech setting as a result. Yeah, no, I like, I like the way you've kind of defined that for, from various different perspectives. I mean, my sort of short way of describing it when everyone asks me, as I say, either it's got, they tend to have a really high IP component and the value tends to lie in data and proof as opposed to number of users or something like this, um, or at least that's how I tend to tend to think about it. And it covers all different areas, you know, you get everything from agriculture through to energy, through to health, um, through to space. What sort of areas are you guys particularly interested in? I can start. So, I mean, we, we look at a, a bunch of areas. I kind of focus slightly more on the, the kind of nearer to commercialization or post-commercialization side of things. So for me, what I'm really looking for right now, I'm really excited about are applications of machine learning and, and some other advanced algorithmic techniques into kind of big and incumbent industries. So to, to put a bit more kind of meat on that, it's, it's kind of machine learning, but it's um, uh, computer vision, it's um, natural language understanding, it's uh, anomaly detection, uh, but other things like simulation and, and, and really powerful computational techniques that you can apply to manufacturing, to construction, to health, to just do kind of transformative things in those businesses that without those technologies you just wouldn't have been able to achieve. And so 
with that comes some of some, some challenges that those markets tend to be harder to, to sell into and the, the disruption of these deep technologies means that adoption cycles are longer and customer education is longer but the the kind of ultimate size of the price size of the opportunity we kind of believe is is pretty impressive and, and pretty significant um, so that's kind of a core I think a couple of other things that are kind of exciting for us right now one is is kind of developer tools or, or kind of um, software that makes machine learning applicable to a broader set of companies so the bar is still uh, high for, for kind of being a, a developer using these technologies and a lot of, of more incumbent companies still find it hard to hire that very premium very expensive talent that is needed to build that build and deploy that technology so companies that are building software that lowers the bar or allows less technical in, uh, individuals to implement that technology and, and allow companies to get that value is, is another area um, and then the last one very quickly is um, sort of small, low-cost robotics, so um, flexible robotic arms, um, and the software that powers them, which we see as a, a super exciting interface between the, the power that some of the software can provide and actual physical processes. I think there's a lot of kind of digital process transformation that's easy to do when you can kind of pipe pieces of software together, but once you're interfacing with a manufacturing line or a, a warehouse, you need some kind of physical interface that can actually do that final step, whether that's kind of picking something up and moving it or screwing something in or plugging it in. And those kind of low cost arms are a kind of great gateway between those two, well, the digital and the, and the physical. And Irina, you're kind of a slightly different side yes. of the coin that you look at. Yeah, I think we overlap in some areas, but because of my background, obviously um, I have an interest in what we call biology 2.0, which is essentially the intersection of engineering, computation and biology, and that creates um, opportunities in multiple areas. One of it is, for instance, drug research. So there's this whole emerging space of computational drug discovery. Um, others are in diagnostics, so using AI and computer vision for, for various areas of medical diagnosis, such as imaging. Um, others are more in kind of like automated in the labs and uh, the tools. Um, so there's a, and, you know, it can go as far as brain machine interfaces um, in, the, in the longer run. Um, that's, that's one. Um, then we also kind of look at this concept of autonomy more broadly. Obviously, what everyone thinks about is autonomous vehicles for, you know, for passenger mobility, but this goes way beyond the concept of autonomy itself in, in you know, autonomy for autonomous vehicles for logistics or for delivery. And it can go as far as like autonomous decision making, like an autonomous diagnostics in healthcare, but then there is in enterprises as well. So that, that is kind of a, another area. What would, you, what would you say is the reason that we're having this discussion? I mean, the, the, the name of the panel is the new era of AI and deep tech. And, you know, deep tech is this term that people, a lot of people are still wrestling with. What is it about the last couple of years or even this year that means that people are talking about this? What's changed? Yeah, so I think the first wave of technology um, that came and created, you know, the first, the Facebooks of this world and so on, were tackling a narrow um, set of industries. Um, and you know, you could say those are low-hanging fruits, although those were difficult businesses to build at the time. But I think now we're moving into an area where to to push that technology innovation, you need to go a bit deeper and to fundamentally change industries that have actually not been touched at all by technology, like construction, like um, health, um, in in some ways. And that's kind of a, a, both a need, but also I think it's it's enabled by the advances we've been making recently. Uh, in AI and computation, in actually big data, we do have more data in, in research tools. Um, and those, all of those have also become cheaper and more accessible. Um, so you have people coming out of academia that, whose career option five years ago was to just stay as a postdoc, um, who now actually have, as a very viable career option, um, the, the, the opportunity to start a business. And they have access and they can do it at a lower cost. Uh, and they increasingly have the ambition because they start seeing role models. So I think we're really at the beginning of an ecosystem being creative, created. You start having investors coming in, although in Europe that's still a little bit like behind the US. But you do have that ecosystem creation elements in various mm -hmm. parts of the market that you kind of can see. Um, so we believe this is a long term trend. Um, and in the end, it's kind of going to merge into what we call tech today, and we're not yeah. going to actually make this difference between deep tech and tech. It's going to become a component of the technology world more broadly. 
one of, it's one of the, oh, the really exciting things on the when you look at these applications is you have this this technical talent, these people who have come out of university have, have taken technology or at least experience they've built in, in academic study. But you also have what we're seeing more and more are people who've got experience in a career in an industry who are who are now looking to pursue some kind of entrepreneurial endeavor. And those people are often taking bigger financial risk than potentially an academic. They're people who are moving from a, a well-salaried kind of career track job to something more risky, but what they bring is deep experience of a sector of an industry, and often they bring a really clear problem that they found. If you've been working in some industry for 10, 20 years, you've often found very significant problems or things that you believe could and should be done better. And so if you combine those people with the great technologists that often have the solution, I think then you can see, and this talks a little bit to kind of how you construct founding teams with, with yeah. deeply academic founders, but those combinations can be very powerful for kind of accelerating very disruptive businesses very quickly. Yeah, and you can definitely see the appetite changing within academia, at least particularly for younger postdocs or, um, or even PhDs or mid-stage, late-stage PhDs coming out. But what about, um, what about the investor appetite? What is the sort of, in Europe particularly, what is the sort of investor landscape look like? Who's investing in deep tech? Who's moving into deep tech? Who should be moving into deep tech? I think Irina touched on, on this a bit. I think that the, the, at the very highest level, it's better now than it was five years ago. So we, we published a report called State of European Tech, and one of the numbers is the, the dollars that went into deep tech funding over the last five years. And so in 2018, there was $4.6 billion that went into European deep tech versus uh, 1.6 um, five years ago. So it's definitely increasing. Uh, that said, I think where there are, are, are gaps and where, or kind of what, what still needs to change, is, is one is kind of really um, kind of long-term thinking capital. So capital that is able to invest in companies early and, and recognize that it takes a lot longer to, to kind of build some of these businesses because there's this long R&D phase before the commercialization phase. I think the second is, is smart capital that understands the, the, the milestones and the different progression and development of a, of a kind of deep tech business, which often looks more kind of stepwise than, than linear. It's not like an enterprise software company where you start selling and it goes up and to the right. It can have these kind of steps where technical milestones de-risk and increase value. And then the last one that kind of, for me, ties into this kind of academic thing is um, a lot of the, the capital we've seen in an, either university-led kind of tech transfer and, and spin out or the sort of the first wave of capital in and around those university ecosystems hasn't had the, the kind of depth or the supportiveness to really mm -hmm. help those founders to kind of realize big and global ambition and has often, I think, stopped some of those journeys short. So I think there's, there's kind of real opportunity on those vectors to, to kind of improve things. I don't know. Yeah, Irina, from your perspective, I mean, c c talking about sort of advantages, disadvantages of Europe, I mean, I, from, from my perspective, I kind of see Europe as having this incredible opportunity. We've got awesome universities, awesome IP, awesome research coming out. Um, and things are starting to change with tech transfer a little bit. Um, I always kind of find it interesting that Stanford's standard um, percentage equity that they take is 5% and um, Imperial's standards is 40%. So it kind of doesn't really make sense in that respect. Um, but, but from your perspective, what, what do you see the opportunity or the advantages and advantages right now in, in Europe? We actually think that Europe has um, probably an unprecedented opportunity with deep tech that it didn't necessarily have with the at the beginning of the tech revolution, if you want, um, which is we do have um, some of our world's leading universities, um, you know, 14 out of top 50 computer science universities in the world are in Europe and five out of the top 10. And not only that, but actually acquiring talent here and retaining it is easier than in a very, very competitive environment like Silicon Valley, um, and it's cheaper. So that should actually create opportunities for more company creation, and, and companies that are set up here generally keep their teams here because they can find really good scientists, really good engineers that stay longer here. The challenges are, yes, definitely around um, tech transfer and the companies that have succeeded so far have somehow managed to get themselves out of the university, like negotiate the IP in a way and actually not have anything to do yeah. with the universities, which is unfortunate. Um, I think slowly, slowly they're starting to change, but that's longer. I think most founders still kind of go around. The other challenge is funding. I mean, there aren't that many um, deep tech investors in Europe. And then it's if kind of like if two or three uh, 
let's say, you know, five of the ones that are around don't invest in you, then what do you do? Like, what are your options? If you think about US, there is, there is just a higher number. So I do think um, there are challenges both at Series A and then there's challenges even later, right? Because these businesses need capital uh, for longer term. And so that's, I think, the challenge that Europe still has. Mm -hmm. But then I think, and, and I'm going to end on this question because I think this is the one that, that people tend to at least ask me about if they're not already in the deep tech space or even people who are, are, are very interested. When you look at the sort of risk appetites um, in the, the Europe versus US, and then you bring up um, the Theranos example, you know, how do you think about, um, I guess, ethics of investing in deep tech or how do we think about due diligence? How do we think about um, taking really risky bets when you're, you know, looking at a technology that is literally being built by the world expert on it and it's very difficult to, to check? How do you, how do you think about these things? I mean, look, I think that, that's, a, that's a lot of topics in one, in one question. I think, um, part of, of how we're set up, and I think what you need to do is really understand these these technologies. And you may not be the world expert, but you've got to be able to go a level deeper and, and kind of push to do that diligence. I think, again, that's one of the areas where Europe and, and the kind of people investing in Europe are, are still some way behind some of the depth of real technical experience that you see in some of the best funds in, in the Valley. And I think we're kind of, we're, we're upskilling ourselves, but I think there's still that gap. Um, I think ethics is a, a kind of minefield of a question. I think that one of the things maybe I'll let Irina touch on just for two seconds is, is kind of how we're, we're, we're thinking about that. But it's, it's something that we feel as an investor is really our responsibility to support our, our, our investments, our portfolio companies in thinking through. Yeah, so recently we've um, developed this program called Conscious Scaling, which is essentially an, um, an exercise we do with all our companies right after we invest or right before we invest. Um, and having them think about if you are, in 10 years from now, assuming you have succeeded in your vision and in everything you want to achieve, what could go wrong? Or put differently, if there was a Black Mirror episode about the company, what would that be? Mm. Um, and it's actually interesting how much like, founders engage with it and how actually they start taking it on board. And the idea is by thinking early about those things, you can start thinking about which are kind of KPIs you can measure, um, things you can review on a regular basis that indicate you're, you're starting to go into the, the wrong direction. Um, so that's something we just recently started, but I think it's, it's one way to make it really concrete, not just kind of general, oh, we're all going to lose our jobs, but actually about this business, you know, what are the specific dangers? Yeah, I think it's nice you guys are bringing that in from the, at the business point, I think yeah. one sort of discussion that kind of happens along the, if you think about the journey of deep tech, um, I, you know, I always sort of pose this question to scientists saying, you know, do you believe that all, all, all researchers as part of their grant funding should have to write science fiction? And it'd be right at that sort of starting point, because sometimes when it comes to commercialization, it's almost too late in terms of what we created. But anyway, guys, we're, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for, for joining this panel and for being so candid with your answers and, and sharing a little bit about this, this new era of, um, of deep tech. Please join me in uh, thanking Ben and Irina. Thank you.